Well, Revelation chapter 16, we're going to be starting in verse 10, but let's pray first. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. Again, we are so thankful. We have it so much better, Lord, in this environment, this climate that our world is in right now. Lord, fear is currency, Lord, and people are spending that currency like crazy, Um, and so many people are buying into it. But Lord, we don't need to have fear as your people. Lord, even as we read this passage on the judgments that you will be bringing forth to this earth in the future, Lord, as your people, we have nothing to fear, Lord. And we thank you for that. So as we study, Lord, open our eyes to what you have to say to us. Let us not be distracted by the things going on, the things that happened last week, the things that are going to go on this week, Lord. We're here sitting at your feet, God, to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Revelation chapter 16, starting in verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their swords, and they did not repent of their deeds. So as the bowl judgments come to an end, we'll see... That the judgment of the Lord will come to an end. The seven bold judgments are the final judgments poured out on the earth. What we'll find out at the last bowl is the angel will even say it's done, it's finished. But even with that, we have to still, I think the question still might linger in our mind the more we see these judgments and how harsh and severe they are. I think that at least for me, the question is why is this judgment coming? Or why is it so harsh? Well, we have to remember that our sin has caused us to go into debt and the Lord is coming to collect that payment. But for those of us in Christ, we'll find out this morning, and well, I hope we already know, for those of us in Christ, that payment has already been made, that debt has been cleared. We are free and clear. So this fifth bowl, this first bowl we're looking at this morning, the fifth bowl, We see this fifth bowl, this angel pours out his bowl. And like some of the other bowls of judgment before this one, this judgment parallels a judgment that happened in Egypt in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 10, one of the plagues of Egypt, there's this judgment of darkness. And let me read to you exactly what they experienced in Egypt during this judgment. In Exodus chapter 10, starting in verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. So where the children of Israel stayed, it was bright, there was light, there was no reason to be fearful. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones go with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself, and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, You have spoken well. I will never see your face again. So for three days in Egypt, except where the children of Israel dwelt, there was thick darkness in the land. God says, darkness that would be felt. Darkness that would be felt. Now, I remember as a kid growing up being afraid of the dark. Um, And... uh, even with my kids today, you know, when, we, when they go to bed, we, there's got to be some source of light on there. Why? Because if not, well, they'll come out of the room and be scared and all these different things because they're afraid of the dark and there's that darkness that can almost be felt. 
Here, back in Revelation, in this fifth bowl, he pours out this, angel pours out this bowl on the, notice this, on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness. Now, something to take note of there. He says the throne of the beast and his kingdom. At this time, the beast, the Antichrist, he has a kingdom on earth. He has a, I would, it's a throne, but it's more of a pseudo throne. And it's important to take note of that because he will be ruling on this earth. But what will his ruling be known for? Be known for darkness, full of darkness. And it says, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Now, if you remember in the previous judgments, especially in the first bowl, they had loathsome sores and boils all over their skin. The people did. The waters then were turned to blood. And then after that, fire scorched them. I mean, people were in horrible pain. We talked about last week too how the fire judgment came after all the water was turned to blood. So that relief couldn't be felt from the fire. Now in the plagues of Egypt, each one of those plagues ended. There's the plague, plague of frogs, the frogs subsided, the plague of flies, the flies subsided, the locusts, the locusts subsided, the plague of darkness, it was only for how long? For three days, right? What we see in Revelation is that these judgments don't have an end. These loathsome sores from the first judgment, they don't end at the second bowl of judgment. But it's judgment added on top of what's already been there. So at this time, they're in complete darkness and they have loathsome sores all over their body. And it says they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And in verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. Instead of realizing all of these judgments that were coming upon them were, be, were coming because of their sin, because they were blaspheming the Lord, instead of repenting, they continue to blaspheme the Lord. Just like Pharaoh with Moses. Every time these plagues happened, what happened to Pharaoh's heart? He continued to harden it. Instead of realizing, hey, my hard heart is causing these plagues. Why were the plagues coming to Egypt in the first place? Because Pharaoh's hard heart would not let the people go. And Pharaoh continued to harden his heart. It, he hardened his heart to the point that God was hardening his heart because that's what Pharaoh wanted. He wanted his heart to be hard towards the Lord. These people here, even in darkness and pain and sores and rivers and... Uh, the, we, we saw last week the economy is destroyed because all the rivers and sea is just, everything is dead in them. You know, sometimes we have this, you see it in Christendom a lot in the church. And I know the Lord does work in this way, but this isn't always the case, but we sometimes think that when the Lord brings us through trials, He does it so that way we will. He does it and then we will repent. And that's not always the case. We see here that these people were brought low, so low, and yet they refused to repent. Man, even given no other option than Jesus Christ, a lot of times will still not choose. Jesus Christ. Backed into a corner. Maybe some of you were that way at one point. You really didn't have anywhere to go, but you still didn't want to go to Christ because that meant I'd have to repent of my sins and my lifestyle and give up my life to this person and then I have to do those things rather than living how I want to live. They still refused to repent and they blasphemed God. 
we'll see that continues to be the case as we move on in verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now the beginning of this next bowl judgment starts at the river Euphrates which has been a place of interest before in the Bible. It's mentioned in Genesis. It's mentioned throughout Israel's history. It was called a great river. But where it's really interesting is in Jeremiah 46. In Jeremiah 46, the Lord is prophesying against Egypt. And if we know our Bibles, we know that Egypt is always a picture of the world. And he says in Jeremiah 46.10, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. The sword shall devour, it shall be satiated and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel speaks of these nations coming from the east and their path is going to be made way by the, by the river Euphrates being dried up. They're going to use the river Euphrates basically as a highway to come right into what we'll find out later, the area of Megiddo, of Armageddon, as we might know it. And in verse 12, we see that this angel is, in a way, he's preparing the way for the kings of the east to come in, to have this final battle with the Lord. In fact, if we continue on in verse 13, he says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle that the great day of the God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now this next part that we just read, it's, it's a little odd because there is no perfect understanding of a lot of the pictures that we see or of what John sees. John at the beginning sees frogs coming out of the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now we're really not 100% sure about the frogs, what they mean, what they signify, we do know that in the plagues of Egypt, one of the plagues was frogs. We also know that from the Levitical law, frogs would have been an unclean animal that the Israelites weren't supposed to eat. And so an unclean animal, probably a plague, it just could be a picture of an unclean spirit. We are told though that these frogs were demons for they are spirits of demons. Another thing we don't know much about uh, up until now is the false prophet. We're, we were told about the dragon earlier on, the dragon being Satan. We were told about the beast earlier on, the beast being the Antichrist, the, the ruler of this earth physically during this time. But the false prophet is someone that we haven't seen yet. And John makes mention of him as if we already know or we, we should know who he is. Now, throughout church history, False prophets, not just church history, but even in Israel's history, false prophets were warned about. Right? The people were to look out for false prophets. These false prophets were people who would deny, in, in the New Testament, they would deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They would deny his deity or maybe his virgin birth. They might deny that he even died on the cross or deny that he rose again or maybe deny that he was sinless. And yet one of the things with these false prophets is that they usually could perform great signs and wonders. You know, a false prophet who couldn't perform great signs and wonders probably isn't a good one. No one's following them. But since they're never right about what they're prophesying about, they have to get people in on other ways. In fact, that's what this false prophet seems to do. Later on in chapter 19, we'll see this false prophet mentioned again. And this false prophet had said in chapter 19 that he was the one responsible for leading the earth in the worship of the beast. 
this false prophet would perform great signs and wonders to kind of um, solidify the kingdom of the beast. In a way, this false prophet would have been like a priest between the Antichrist and the people. And so we see in this picture is that there's these demons that look like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And what they do is they go and they have influence on the kings and the powers of this world. Right? It says there in verse 14, they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. I, I always wondered, you know, why would the nations want to take on the Lord? I mean, don't, don't they know that they would just get crushed? I mean, we, we have it prophesied here that you know, about the blood rising up to the horse's bridle. But we're told here it's because these demons that perform signs, they influence and they convince these kings to puff themselves up with pride and think they can take on the Lord. In fact, many nations have felt that way over time. We read in the Old Testament, many nations who were puffed up with pride that thought they could take on Israel and the armies of the Lord. Right? One of the most famous is King Sennacherib. King Sennacherib comes in from Assyria and he writes a letter to King Hezekiah, the king of Israel at the time. And he says, Hezekiah, I've gone through all these other nations and their gods couldn't save them. I went to this nation with their God, easily defeated them. Went to this nation, their God, boom, easily defeated them. What makes you think your God will save you against me and my great army? Hezekiah gets the letter. What does he do? He goes to the temple of the Lord. He spreads the letter out before the Lord. And he says, Lord, he's not talking trash to me. He's talking trash to you. He's not trying to fight me. He's trying to fight you. He's calling you out. And what happened to King Sennacherib and his army when he tried to face the Lord? He was utterly defeated. I believe it's because he was influenced by demons. What, why did the angel and, or why did Lucifer fall from heaven? Because he was puffed up with pride against the Lord. Why do we sin? Why do we reject the Lord God? Because we're puffed up with pride against the Lord. We know better than Him. We're the masters of our own destinies. Or so we think. Now this isn't a conspiracy theory. I'm not talking about lizard people or anything like that. But we see here, right here in Scripture, where it talks about spirits of demons going to kings and rulers and nations and influencing these people, performing great signs and wonders, convincing them to go bow to the Lord, and it's the same today. We have to remember, first off, that our enemy is not flesh, right? Paul says that in Ephesians 6. We battle not against flesh and blood, but, but against powers and principalities and the powers of the air. Speaking of demons and the devil. We have to remember that these, even these nations and rulers that are wicked as they are, and they do need to be stopped, right? When, when Hitler was in Germany... In fact, one of the, um, there was a pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was heavily involved with his assassination attempts. And we know from history he was never successful in that, but he eventually was captured by the Nazis and ended up dying in a Nazi prison camp, or a Nazi jail, I'm sorry. 
right? He needed to be stopped, but even he realized that this was not just Hitler woke up one day and decided, I want to do these things. This was under the influence, demonic influence. This wickedness in our world is, is a demonic influence. Even Eve, when she took the fruit, she didn't take it from herself. She took it from, a, from the demonic influence, from Satan himself. Now we are still responsible for all of our sins. And, and even these wicked leaders that might be influenced demonically, they will still have to answer for their sins because we all have the choice. Eve had the choice. Adam had a choice. We have all had a choice. But we can't be fools to not see the spiritual side of things. We can't be fools to think that, oh, we took down this wicked nation. Now our, our world will be a better place, right? In the 40s, I'm sure everyone thought that after defeating the Nazis and, and Japan, and the world was at peace, they, they thought. Not 20 years later, right? The Cold War begins. And now there's another wicked nation. We took down the, we won the Cold War. I don't know if we won the Cold War. I don't know who says that, but, right? But there's still wicked nations, right? We can think of a few today, North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan. We take down those countries and those leaders and guess what? There's going to be another nation that rises up. Wickedness will abound. And we can't be fools to think that, oh, if we take out this guy, peace. No. There's demonic influence and these nations are being influenced. Our nation is being influenced demonically. It's been being influenced demonically for decades. And that's why we need to pray for our leaders. Pray that they would not be influenced by those things. We need to pray that they would be influenced by the Holy Spirit. If that if they don't know the Lord, they would be saved. To do the things of the Lord, not the things of this world. And then in verse 15, Jesus has another warning to those that would hear this before it happens. So that's you and me. I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. See, prophecy as doom and gloom as it might be, prophecy's main message is to warn people to repent and turn to God. Revelation isn't just some weird book with dragons and beasts and uh, all these other things. It's a book to warn people to turn to the Lord. Even Jonah's message to Nineveh. Jonah's message to Nineveh was not, you know, you wouldn't go visit Jonah at a crusade or a rally for, to put out a gospel message. All he did is said, 30 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. He didn't say, but if you say this prayer with me right now and you come on down front and you get a t-shirt and get baptized. No, he just, all he said, 30 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. The whole point of that was the Lord telling him to say that message was to warn the people. And what happened? The people of Nineveh heeded the warning of Jonah. And they repented. And the Lord relented. The whole point of prophecy is to warn us. To, to tell us to turn to the Lord. And it says that these demonic influences in 16, they gathered them together to the place in Hebrew, called in Hebrew Armageddon, or the region of Megiddo, where many battles in the history of Israel happened. In fact, if you read through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, the book of Joshua, the valley of Megiddo was a place where many battles took place. 
In fact, even after Israel, many battles took place in this region of Megiddo. They say even up to Napoleon's time, many battles were fought there. But there will finally be this one battle, this final battle that will take place. In verse 17, we're going to see this, the finality of God's judgment. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities and nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail since that plague was exceedingly great. Now when the last bowl is poured out, something interesting happens. Notice what what they say at the end of verse 17. And then an, when the loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Now, this saying it is done should immediately bring us back to the cross of Christ. I would hope. In John chapter 19, we see that Jesus on the cross declares probably the greatest words for any believer, any person to hear. It is finished. You know, I work at a, many of you know I work at a credit union and many times we have people come in to pay off their loans. They might pay with cash, they might pay with check, they might just transfer funds from the account to their loan to pay it off. And when they do, you know what they want? They want that receipt that shows the zero balance before they walk out. They want to make sure that it's done. They want me to go back into their account and see that the account is closed now. That there's not a payment due next month. That there's not a balance still on the account. Oh, well, you know, yeah, you, you paid it off, but you know, there's a fee to pay it off and this or that. Well, they want to see that zero balance. That's exactly what Jesus was declaring in John 19 from the cross. It is finished. The balance is zero. The account is closed out. The debt has been paid. The full wrath of God has been placed on him for our sins and the payment has been made on our account. And this bowl is the completion of the full wrath of God. And that's why the angel says it is done. It is finished. It is complete. And when Jesus was on that cross, he didn't just take a part of the wrath of God, but he took on the full wrath of God. That's why he said to his disciples, you're not ready to drink this cup that I'm about to drink. And on the cross, he experienced the full wrath of God because that's what our sins require. That's the debt that we were dug into, the full wrath of God. Not a slap on the wrist, but as we've been looking at, sores, blood, darkness and pain, men are being scorched, a final battle. This is what we deserved. But it wasn't just in the declaration that we can see these similarities to the cross of Christ, but also in Matthew 27, once Jesus died and he, after he proclaims it is finished and he yields up his spirit, what happens right after that? A great earthquake. And at that time it says a great earthquake like no man has felt ever before. What happens here? After the angel says it is done, there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake. Such was one had not occurred since men were on the earth. But see, the difference is, the difference between those two stories, the one we have here in Revelation and the one we have on the cross of Jesus Christ, 
is the full wrath of God on the, was placed on Jesus before, but now the full wrath of God is placed on Babylon, the great city Babylon. It says the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Again, remember, Babylon is a picture of the world. Just like Jerusalem's kind of the capital, was the capital of Israel and is the kind of the religious capital, Babylon is the, the capital of this world. And it will receive, the, the world will receive the full cup of the fierceness of his wrath. And we can see God uses the natural things, lightning, earthquakes, thunderings. And then after that, great hail fell from heaven upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. What did they do, even at the last judgment? What did they do? Did they repent? Did Pharaoh repent when he had, after the death of the firstborn? No, he got Moses out of there because he was tired of dealing with Moses. But what did he do once Moses left? He chased him down. And he chased him down into his own demise. The people of God will continue, or not the people of God, the people of this earth will continue to blaspheme God and not repent because of the hardness of their hearts. I praise God this morning that he hardened, he softened my heart. I praise God that he softened hopefully your hearts and that you've repented. Because these judgments are what we've all deserved. This is the path that we were heading down. Paul says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But it's not lightly going in your sleep. It's like the cross of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion. Even to this day, crucifixion is one of the worst ways to die. In fact, we even got the word excruciating from the crucifixion. The word excruciating wasn't a word that was invented, but the Romans couldn't find a way to describe the pain inflicted upon someone when they were crucified, so they made this new word called excruciating, which means to bear the same amount of pain as crucifixion. So you know when your back is in excruciating pain? It could be worse. <laughs> but that's what we've all deserved. But see, there was a declaration already made and there will be a declaration made. And we can either trust in the declaration that's already been made by Jesus Christ on the cross saying, it is finished, the payment is done, the debt has been paid, or we can wait till we hear it in another light saying it is done and the great judgment of God is poured out on this earth and you are part of that judgment. For those with Christ, the payment's been made. For those without Christ, the payment is coming due. And we should praise God for those of us who have our debts paid off. But to those who don't, it should come as a warning. This is, this is your chance. This is a warning to you. This should be a wake-up call even for believers. The people's debt still hasn't been paid. Or they haven't, it's been paid, but they haven't trusted in Christ. They want to try and pay it themselves. And so even though we see the full wrath of God here this morning, it should remind us of the full grace and mercy that he's given us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so let's pray and we'll thank him for that. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy only found in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for paying our debt, Lord, despite none of us deserving it, none of us earning it. 
Lord, but you willingly gave your son as a sacrifice for us, who he willingly gave up his life for us. And so, Lord, as we even see this morning that it is done, you will bring the full wrath of your full wrath on this earth for its sins. Lord, we can trust in your son and we can stand on the promise of it is finished. And so, Lord, even as we go this week, fill us with your spirit, continuing to walk in that promise of it is finished. Not to be held down by our sin, but to look towards you, the author and finisher of our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand for this last?